Thank you, Walter. Thank you, Rachel, my longtime friend and great artist. And uh, thank you very much for inviting me here today. Uh, I just wrote this. Uh, you can teach art, you can teach sculpture using anything. Um, it doesn't really matter. Um, as long as you have a plan, and that's what I have to say about what we should teach them. I would like to focus uh, on one claim made for the symposium in the promotional materials, uh, that we will explore the intersection of art and cultural hegemony, or rather the power of certain forms or habits over others. I will argue that art, and notably our students, resist power today not by offering an alternative to its dominant appearance, generally ugly and poorly made, but rather by replicating it, <laughs> thanks for laughing, Rachel, to reveal its sources of pleasure. They do, I believe, as artists, say thanks for everything, even the terrible. They, in short, attempt to increase joy of what is, no matter how bad it looks. When I first got my job as chair of Otis uh, undergraduate program, I was asked to say what my vision was. And I told the board of directors, because I, you know, just a kind of a whim, my, my goal was to increase joy. And then I started to believe it, uh, that, <clears throat> that my goal as a teacher is identical to my goal as an artist. The purpose of education and art is to increase joy to find through keener and keener powers of perception and understanding the pleasure in everything. The educated person is one who has developed the cognitive skill to identify pleasure. And they can apply their cognitive and sensual skills to identify that the thing before them pleases someone and it was made for that purpose. Art is powerful because it understands power as it reveals itself on the sensual level. Uh, driving to Claremont today, I was looking at the buildings along the 10, um, you know, the endless stream of one-story buildings, Taco Bells, Pizza Huts, etc. And I suspended my uneducated, which is to say anti-philosophic judgment that would say, that would ask this question, why is America so ugly and so full of assholes? <laughs> Instead, <clears throat> I wondered who, under what conditions, thought those things I was looking at were beautiful. Who do they give pleasure to? And in what way are they an attempt to increase joy? So near my house, there's this free pumpkin patch. Um, and, uh, and it you know, looks like this. Oh yeah. So this is one of the items in the pumpkin patch, the tiger, the filthy tiger, and uh, <clears throat> the monumental sculpture. And uh, here's another view of this. And you know, this was just so astonishingly ghastly that I, I just had to you know, look at it. And of course, you know, my initial reaction was, How, why did they have this dirty, disgusting tiger? But then I had to use my, th my thinking here is like, well, how is this pleasure? How is, does this increase joy? That, that you know, the person who put this up just didn't say, you know, they, they, they actually like it. In the same way, you could apply that to things that we take seriously and believe are, are beautiful and, and valuable. And, I recently went to Tikal, which is in what's now Guatemala. And so we you know, have to look at this and you have to say, uh, what gave the Mayans pleasure? We have to ask that as artists. I mean, archaeologists might ask another question. But as artists, we have to ask, in what way do they manifest pleasure through the senses? You know, they like things that are tall and dominating, etc. I also recently went uh, with my son to New York into Times Square. And, you know, we all know Times Square is terrible, run by Disney, all this kind of stuff. Um, <clears throat> but you really can, as an artist, take that position. You have to take the position, which I think my son did in this photograph, which is to just see the power, right? He sees the power of these cops. And it's a beautiful picture. This is our conundrum, right? Like, because we're like, well, we should be against the cops, right? But those, those horses are amazing. But we, in the photograph, he, to me at least, he reveals what the cops think is beautiful, what the cops find pleasure in, and that is in, in being taller than everybody else and this beautiful horse, etc. He also, you know, uh, de depressingly, but maybe not, thought this, he took this picture of the Coca-Cola sign, right? So he sees this, you know, big corporate phallic th thing and says, wow, that's fantastic, I'm gonna take a picture of that. I then visited Thomas Hershorn's monument to Gramsci, 
that the forest houses, uh, <coughs> it's a housing project built in the uh, 50s in the Bronx. And there's a lot of activities that went on here. Um, and, <coughs> and you'll see some of them, you know, he set up a computer lab and he set up a, a cafe and all this kind of stuff. Uh, and, and, in, and in Hirshhorn's view, well, I wondered, you know, which, so the flag is obviously Hirshhorn's and the housing project in the back. Is he saying housing project bad, flag good? I don't think so. I don't think so. So there's something, he was seeing the, he had to see the joy in the project, right? There was something about that which appealed to him. He wouldn't say that probably, but he would rather say art, because it's art, is resistance. I'm quoting her, Sean. Resistance to aesthetical, cultural, and political habits. And he, you know, wants to give a monument to Gramsci. And then Gramsci, in a nutshell, sought in his numerous writings, uh, some done in prison while incarcerated by Mussolini, he sought to undo capitalist control, hegemony, to give power to the workers. Hirshhorn, we can assume, <clears throat> is not the, the same, not a journalist or a long-time uh, organizer of, of workers, but rather through art, which he calls resistance, and I call a particular attitude to joy, or the appearance of joy. He likes the way this looks. My favorite Thomas Hirshhorn motto is energy yes, quality no. Hirshhorn's joy is the slapdash, the impermanent, the taped, the neutral, the line, movement up and down. Moving through a space, pushing you to move through an environment, up and down stairs, many compartments, the many. The New York Times found it sad, the piece was sad, because they commented that the sculpture would be taken down and things would return to business as usual. But to me, the work had the temporary melancholic quality of joy of the pumpkin patch. The work does not, as many of our students do not, resist aesthetical habits. It embraces aesthetical cultural habits joyfully. It might be, as Jerry Saltz recently described such work, to be neo-mannerist, what he called anarchy light, piles of junk held together with hot glue. I, however, see it differently. I see Hirshhorn's work and imitations of it, can we really get enough of that, as a Dionysian pleasure-seeking embrace of the shit storm of temporary culture. The challenge or resistance in art is not in its critical capacity to condemn existing conditions, but to reveal the con existing conditions in a complicating way to reveal the joy in everything, even the terrible. So in the end, I'm saying that Hirshhorn's work looks like the pumpkin patch. It is not resisting the pumpkin patch. Thank you.